Hello and welcome to the Literary Lair, and to the first review of 2020. Last month I mentioned that Crisis on Infinite Earths is my favorite event comic of all time. However, my favorite comic book of all time is Kingdom Come. Between the story that embodies all that I love about Superman and what he represents, Alex Ross's amazing artwork, and just the grandeur of the entire comic, it's world's finest. This was actually what I was planning on doing last year, or rather I planned on looking at the novelization, since when I thought about what Superman story I'd want to share with you all, Kingdom Come was the first one that came to my mind. But I went with Last Son of Krypton for a couple reasons, mainly because it was the origin story, and I'm glad that I did, because since then, not only did we get to see the Kingdom Come-style costumes for the Trinity be shown in live action, Wonder Woman's in promotional material for Wonder Woman 1984, and Superman's and Batman's on the CW Crisis crossover, but we also got the return of my favorite living live-action Superman in that same crossover, since Brandon Routh reprised his role as the Superman Returns Superman, and we were shown that a Kingdom Come-style event had taken place in that universe, causing Ralph Superman to wear the Kingdom Come costume. And since this is the second year that we're looking at a Superman book, it's rather fitting that Elliot S. Magan, who wrote Last Son of Krypton, novelized Kingdom Come for Warner Books. Can't think of a better way to start off the decade than this. This is Kingdom Come. cover is gorgeous. It's the Alex Ross artwork, so it's always great, but this takes the cake. We've got the Trinity with Batman and Wonder Woman looking stoic, and Superman with arms outstretched and screaming as smoke and fire billow around them. It's also a wraparound, which I think is pretty unique for paperback books, so we also see Norman McKay praying and the shadowy image of Captain Marvel, and no, I will not call him Shazam on the back. It's a little undercut by the giant barcode, but I can live. We also get the title up top on the front cover in large letters that really spell out the grandeur of the story, along with telling us that it was by Elliot S. Magan, based on a story by Mark Wade and Alex Ross. To go back to something I said last year, I knew that Magan was a writer for DC, but I had no idea how far his work spanned, or that he had, in fact, appeared in-universe in a story where he and writer Carrie Bates were transported from Earth Prime to Earth 2, and he aided in the JLA and JSA in stopping Carrie Bates from wreaking havoc with newfound powers and, and insanity. There's also the Little Elseworlds sticker to remind us that this story has no bearing on the main continuity of DC Comics. On to the story. Our story begins in the magnificent, far-off future year of 2020. Yet another reason I pushed it last year. Can't be timelier than the present. While this is ultimately a Superman story, we don't begin with Superman. Rather, we begin on a world without Superman. Ten years ago... Superman left the public eye after the Joker gassed the Daily Planet building and killed the entire staff, including Perry White, Jimmy Olsen, and Lois Lane. Superman failed to respond because he was stopping a major disaster elsewhere, having ducked out right before the Joker arrived and being unable to stop it. In her dying breath, Lois begged Superman not to kill the Joker in reprisal, and he adhered to her wishes. He brought the Joker in alive. However, like Jack Ruby and Oswald, the new superhero, Magog, who looks like a buff Loki drawn by Rob Liefeld, kills the Joker before his trial instead. And when Superman, who had left his ID on an unidentifiable body at the Daily Planet and shed his Clark Kent identity permanently upon Lois' death, tries to bring Magog to justice, 
the jury acquits Magog because he killed a killer. Sure, the number of killers in the world remains the same, but Magog isn't causing chaos for chaos's sake. Seeing that he was no longer relevant in this new grim dark world of murderous heroes, Kalel retired to the Fortress of Solitude, content to farm in a holographic representation of his native Kansas. Those holographic cows make for really good holographic meatloaf, you know. In the interim, most of the classic heroes have retired, and while some children have taken up their parents' mantles, the JLA and JSA are gone. Norman McKay is a preacher and the last friend of Wesley Dodds, a.k.a. the Golden Age superhero Sandman. I'd wonder where Sandy was, but given that Wesley turned him into a sand golem for like 20 years, I get the feeling that they don't speak much, and Dodds is dying, with prophetic dreams wreaking havoc on his sanity in his final days, real fire and brimstone type stuff. And when he dies, he passes on that power to McKay. And in those dreams, McKay sees an apocalypse-level event shake the world. And then that event happens. While fighting the parasite, Magog and his team of quote-unquote heroes, with no regard for casualties or collateral damage, accidentally let Parasite tear into Captain Adam's containment suit, and he explodes, irradiating Kansas and a good chunk of America's heartland. The biggest casualty obviously being the loss of Sergeant Pepper and his Lonely Hearts Club band. The radiation was just too strong for their magic instruments to handle. This causes McKay to be visited by Detective Jim Corrigan, a.k.a. the Spectre, who asks him to pass judgment on the upcoming apocalypse. This allows the Spectre to take McKay to observe the proceedings from all angles, because there are two distinct stories going on. The first involves Diana going to the fortress and begging Clark to return to the world because it needs Superman. As much as he wants to stay away, he can't, and he reforms the Justice League, pulling as many friends out of retirement as possible, like Wally West, now living in a state of constant vibration, and taking care of catastrophes in Keystone City at unimaginable speeds. Alan Scott, who monitors Earth from a space station built of his own willpower called New Oa, and the now-adult Dick Grayson and Donna Troy, who return to their mantles of Robin and Wonder Girl, along with Diana, among many others. The only stickler is Bruce, who resents Clark for turning his back and has retreated in the patrolling Gotham with bat-sentinel robots, since the years of vigilantism have taken a bit of a toll on his body, leaving him in a metal exoskeleton to be able to move around, and he's estranged from Dick. Never thought I'd say it, but I think Batman Beyond has the most optimistic view of future Bruce that I've ever seen. Bruce is also living out of his cave because his identity went public years earlier, causing Two-Face and Bane to destroy it. But Bruce is the world's greatest detective, and he's always playing the long game, so with his fellow powerless vigilantes like Oliver Queen, Dinah Lance, and Ted Kord, the former heroes Green Arrow, Black Canary, and Blue Beetle, he attempts to worm his way into Lex Luthor's Mankind Liberation Front, with both Clark and Ollie recruiting out of a pool of young, fresh heroes into their own respective ranks. Bruce and his group are welcomed into the MLF, featuring new faces like Ibn al-Zuthish, Ra's al Ghul's successor as leader of the League of Assassins, and familiar faces like Lex, Vandal Savage, Selina Kyle, and her guest Edward Nigma, who has shown no respect from the other villains. My guess is they've seen Batman forever. But that's okay, because Nigma knows something that many of them don't, and Bruce suspects. Luther has a butler. And while his name isn't revealed until later, no doubt he looks rather familiar. His butler's name is William Batson, but once upon a time, he went by Billy. Bruce suspects that Luther has brainwashed him, and in a meeting with the MLF, he tries to use John Jones's power to tell, but John has seen far better days and can't manage it. Even the wizard Shazam can't help Billy, begging the other powers that be, Ganthet, High Father, Phantom Stranger, and Zeus who refused to interfere any further because their warnings were never heeded. Superman's new league brings villains to justice and holds heroes accountable, with Clark heading to Apocalypse to first try to recruit Orion, who has usurped his father Darkseid to his cause and allow metahuman prisoners to be held on Apocalypse, but he refuses, leading Clark to instead go to Scott Free and Big Barda for help, designing a prison. After all, who better to create an inescapable prison than the world's greatest escape artist? They agree, and the gulag is born. Not that one. Thank you. 
as McKay observes Luther's schemes and Superman tries to reign in metahumans, both heroic and villainous. Fixing Kansas goes decently, as the ray helps to clean up radiation, and the construction of the gulag goes well, with McKay observing the proceedings, even being momentarily spotted by Superman, and the heroes before they get called away and the Spectre pulls McKay back into non-existence. McKay isn't sure what to think of everything and continues his observation. Luther accidentally lets slip to Bruce that he intends to exacerbate the situation between the League and the prisoners, until chaos breaks loose, and when it does, Luther sends Captain Marvel to bust open the gulag and release the prisoners. Bruce gears his outsiders into action, and they hold back the villains, but they can't stop Captain Marvel, and he rushes away. Batman manages to warn Superman, but Marvel holds Superman back, since this version of Superman is susceptible only to magic, as Kryptonite no longer weakens him. Bruce rushes in to help in bad armor, since in the chaos and after what happened in Kansas, the UN plans to use a nuclear bomb to kill all the metahumans to prevent the fright from spreading. Bruce and Diana manage to take out two, but they miss the third one, and Superman manages to grab Billy in mortal form, since he had been switching forms to beat Superman up with the lightning, and tells him about the bomb, saying that Clark can't make the decision, since on the one hand, maybe the world is better off without metahumans, or maybe they're needed. But Earth isn't Superman's planet. Billy Batson is the world's mightiest mortal, with feet in both worlds, and he has to choose. Billy breaks his programming and chooses life, sacrificing himself to stop the nuke, even though it still goes off and kills most of the metahuman superhero population, with only a scant few surviving thanks to the efforts of Mr. Miracle and Alan Scott. Superman, enraged by all the death and destruction, rushes to the United Nations to confront them, and uses heat vision to weld the doors shut before attempting to bring the roof down. McKay demands that the Spectre take him there, and he talks with Clark, telling him that if he follows through, there's no coming back, and he's really angry at himself for everything that's happened since Magog. McKay wants to tell him more, but the Spectre pulls him back. Since a smattering of surviving heroes arrived, Bruce, Diana, Alan Scott, Wally West, Dick Grayson, and his daughter Nightstar, and Magog, among others. Superman reveals his identity to the world and promises to set things right, with the heroes shedding their masks and making friends with the UN, as Dick reconciles with Bruce. In the epilogue, Norman is back to preaching with new life invigorated into him, along with having a new friend, Jim Corrigan, to consult with, and a new parishioner named Clark Kent. Bruce reopens Wayne Manor to take care of the wounded from the Gulag event, even conscripting some of the more rowdy MLF members with inhibitor collars, like Lex Luthor, and spending a lot of time with Ibn, because Ibn al Zafish isn't just Ra's al Ghul's successor. He's his grandson, son of Talia, and Bruce. In the mainstream DC universe, he goes by Damian Wayne, though, and Bruce has gotten both his sons back, and Ibn agrees to put him in contact with Talia. In fact, Ibn is getting along rather well with Nightstar, daughter of Robin and Starfire, so it's one big happy bat family. Diana gets her title back and reopens Paradise Island to teach the new generation of heroes, including Magog, and at Planet Krypton, a Planet Hollywood-style superhero kicks restaurant up, owned and operated by who else but Booster Gold, Diana and Clark, now married, meet with Bruce, where Diana hopes to spring the news that she's pregnant, but Bruce beats her to it. But she manages to shock both soups and bats when she asks Bruce to be the baby's godfather. A half-alien, half-demigod is gonna need a grounded parent, and while Bruce doesn't have a spotless track record, he can handle the responsibility. And the Trinity, finally united again, walk out together as Bruce notices Corrigan and McKay sitting nearby as the story ends. So we're doing things a little differently from now on. Instead of the characters and the action, I'm just going to cover everything in one big middle category called the analysis. So with that, Kingdom Come is a metaphor for the darkening state of the DC Universe and superhero comics in general. Basically, it's what Infinite Crisis wishes it was, and it shows us a world without superheroes to look up to and how it goes to hell in a handbasket. But it's not heavy-handed. It simply states the obvious. If Superman had no moral code and didn't try to minimize debris and loss of life, the world would suck. There's a really good scene in both the comic and the novelization where McKay witnesses a bus crash during a superhuman battle, and he rushes in to save a little girl. 
Because the heroes don't give a crap about the people. They're catching the bad guy, and that's it. it uh, it's up to the normal humans to pick up their slack, and it's one of the big things reinstated after Superman Returns. In a big attack, the old guard takes special care to not only save the infrastructure, but the people as well. And in the artwork it comes across, but the novelization takes it further, putting us into Norman's head and into the head of the little girl that he saved. I said back in my review of The Last Jedi that I'd be coming back to the topic of how certain mediums have certain limitations. Visual mediums, like movies, TV, and, yes, comic books, are beholden to a certain adage. Show, don't tell. As opposed to books, which have to tell because it's the only thing they have to do. Kingdom Come is a truly remarkable story, but I didn't understand it as fully as I do now until reading the novelization. The comic is brilliant, the artwork is superb, and it manages to broadly get across everything that the novelization explains in great detail, but there's just little things. We get a full listing of all the dead and how they died, as opposed to just the artwork showing us the corpses of our beloved heroes. We get a more full description of Bruce's relationship to Ibn, which was a big help because I didn't realize he was Damian Wayne until I read the novelization and Magan mentioned his parentage in the prose. Like, a movie only has two hours to tell a story, a comic book only has a certain number of pages. And while Kingdom Come is a long comic, it just doesn't have the time time to really explore the story the same way that Magan does with his novelization. Honestly, I think the two best novelization writers I've ever read who didn't write the original thing they're novelizing are Jason Fry and Elliot S. Magan. Norman McKay is clearly the main viewpoint character, but I didn't really care about him nearly as much until I read the novelization. Seeing his relationship with the Sandman as Dodds deteriorated, and in the novelization we get a really good scene of McKay and Dodds going into Planet Krypton and noticing all the little inconsistencies of the employees who don't quite match the heroes they portray. And I like that they created a wholly original character to be our eyes into the world, and what Wade and Ross got through on the page with artwork and dialogue, Magan just ran with, giving us his entire higher backstory, and making me sympathize with him in a way that I never did before. I've got a thing with religion, and the biblical subtext of the comic was something that always kept me a little distanced, because I didn't really understand a lot of it, but Magan managed to condense it all into a form I could understand easily, and made McKay a fully fleshed out character that I was excited to follow. I already explained last year that Magan truly understands Superman, and for that matter, so do Wade and Ross, but the way that Superman is used in Kingdom Come is brilliant, and Magan manages to expand on that, giving us the hopefulness, but also Superman's sense of loss, giving us a play-by-play -play of the events leading up to the Joker's attack on the Daily Planet and the trial, showing us just how much Superman lost. He lost not only his friends and his wife, but he lost the people he spent years protecting, who were ready to jump on the 90s superhero bandwagon and accept the irresponsible heroes willing to murder the villains. Ultimately, despite using the scope of the entire DC catalog of heroes and villains, and there are so many, I only got to mention a few favorites, and of course I had to mention Ted Cord, who unfortunately perished in the nuke, a far more dignified death than his mainstream counterpart got. This is ultimately a Superman story, and Mark Wade mentions in the bonus material of the collected edition of the comic that he didn't realize that until the end of the first issue, but it makes sense. Superman was the first hero that basically made DC into what it is today, for better or worse. The real benefit to the novelization, which makes up for the lack of art apart from four pieces of the Trinity and Captain Marvel in this version, is that we really get to explore the Trinity in great detail and how their tactics differ. Bruce is jaded because he never gave up the fight. He kept making Gotham safe. Wonder Woman failed her mission and is far more brutal in this because the Amazons stripped her of her title because she didn't improve the world of man. And Superman didn't fail, but he was failed by those people he was sworn to protect, embracing Magog. But he blamed himself for not stopping the Joker, because that's what started it all. If he had just been slightly faster, maybe Lois would be alive. And the only thing he had left was the promise he made, and Magog took that away too. And that's what makes the ending so sweet, that they're finally together again, having managed to get past their problems and go back to how things should be. 
Heroes being heroes, Bruce got his family back and a possible second chance with one of his many loves. Diana reopened Paradise Island and regained her status and title, and Superman regains his drive to help the world and work with it to make it safe and happy for metas and humans alike. But the real question of the novelization, the, the big question, the one that matters more than anything, is without the beautiful Norman Rockwell-style artwork that the comic has, is the story still brilliant and attention-grabbing? Yes, 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 yes. Magan's expansion takes a great story and improves it tenfold. It had all the greatness of Wade and Ross's story, with every bit of extended dialogue, character interaction, and backstory that I could have ever wished for. The pacing is extremely well done, and while you want to flip each comic page slowly because you want to savor the art, the book is a page-turner, even in the bits of quiet reflection. Kingdom Come is still my favorite comic book ever. But much like The Last Jedi, the novelization is miles ahead by sheer ability to expand. If you like Kingdom Come, the novelization is required reading. And that's not just me saying that. According to Magan's website, Mark Wade said, The novel that Magan is doing is brilliant. It had to be this enormously thick hardcover prose textbook. And I'm reading chapter after chapter, and he's using 30% of Kingdom Come and 70% new stuff. And it's just amazing the stuff he's coming up with. So anyone that likes Kingdom Come, this is required reading. And are you going to argue with the original writer of the comic? One of the greatest aspects of Kingdom Come is that it doesn't require extensive knowledge of the DC Universe. It's an Elseworld, and all the backstory is told in the story. It doesn't even require knowledge of every hero that plays a part, just knowledge of the Trinity, Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman, that everyone already knows because they're the most popular in the public lexicon. Generations of kids grew up watching Superman, Batman, and Wonder Woman on TV, in movies, animated series, who have never so much as touched a comic book. And they can appreciate the story. And the novelization is the same way. If you've never read the comic, I highly recommend reading the comic because it's gorgeous. And if you have read it but have never looked at the novelization, I agree with Mark Wade. It's required reading. Anyway, that's the first video of 2020 in the can. What can you look forward to this year from me? I've got some new video ideas up my sleeves, the 8th anniversary of this show, a bunch more book, movie, and TV show reviews, and the 200th episode of The Literary Lair by my calculation sometime during the summer. I've just got to figure out what I'm reviewing for it. Next video, though, I know what I'm reviewing. To commemorate the return of Patrick Stewart to the role of Jean-Luc Picard in his new CBS All Access series, we're going to take a look at the autobiography of the title character. See you next time. I mean, it's not supposed to be jokey because it's a very dark comic.